Well, good morning, everybody. It's time to get started this morning. Let's all stand as we sing this first song. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Be seated, please. I'd like to welcome everybody this morning, especially our guests who are maybe visiting here with us. Uh, we're happy that you're here. Please stick around that we might get to know you a little bit better. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay, send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crowd of us. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Would you bow with me? Dearly Father, we're truly grateful to have this opportunity to come together to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for every family that's represented here today, and we thank you for the beauty of this day, dear Lord. We thank you uh, for the reprieve from the rain for a little bit, but we're also grateful for that. We know that there are many suffering, um, loss of loved ones. And, um, we pray that you would be with them and comfort their families, dear Lord. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that you loved us so much that, that he gave his life for each and every one of us. We pray that uh, you would be with us and that this worship service would be pleasing and acceptable to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'll read this uh, scripture here out of Romans chapter 8 together out loud if we could. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So this next song is about him giving us those things, uh, the free sacrifice and the grace that we receive. 
God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, free. gospel message encapsulated in one very short, uh, kind of neat song. Oh, listen to our wondrous story, counted once among the lost, yet one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful Saved us from eternal who but God's Son upon the cross. He died for you. We leave it now. Heaven interceding. No angel could his place have taken. I is up high though he. The loved one on the cross forsaken was one of the Godhead three who saved us from eternal loss. What did he do? Here is he now. Humbly bow, you too shall come to know his favor. He will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now?
Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful day for us to commune together, for us to have family, church members, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, to gather here and to worship our Savior who died on the cross for us. The verse that we're going to be reading today is going to be John chapter 16, starting at verse 5. I'll finish wherever the Spirit leads me to. So, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. The counselor will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regards to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. When I think of this passage, I think about what Jesus had to do to pay the penalty for us as God's only son, the right hand of the judgment seat of Christ. And he had to go so that the Holy Spirit could be sent to his disciples to speak the message of the gospel. The Holy Spirit we are sealed by in baptism when we die in full immersion and are risen up to worship and to follow the only one who should ever be imitated, Jesus Christ. Let us reflect on these things as we take of the body, as we take of the cup, and as we give generously with our hearts. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, I thank you so much uh, for your care for us and that uh, Jesus was willing to fulfill the promise of, of salvation for us. And uh, Father, I just pray that you'll be with us now, be with our hearts, Lord God, as we partake of this bread, that uh, we can recognize the sacrifice that went before us, that we could partake of it this way, that we could do this as brothers and sisters in Christ who believe in your Son and in uh, in the grace and the, and the, uh, the life to come uh, that goes with that. I just thank you for your care right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this cup. Um, this cup is the new covenant in your blood. We drink of it in remembrance of you. We drink it in remembrance of your life, your death, and your resurrection. And we will drink it in remembrance of you until you return. Amen. And I hope, our hope is that someday that we will drink it with you new in your Father's kingdom. Amen. As we take the offering, what a blessing it is to be able to give when we think about Jesus who first gave to us. Uh, first John says that we love not because we first loved him, but because he first loved us. And so we have an example in the life of Jesus of what it looks like to give. So let's reflect all of us on how we can grow closer to God through our uh, deeper act of giving in the varied ways that that looks like in our lives. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for all that you do. We're thankful for uh, you giving Christ, for Christ giving his life, and for the example that he is to us on what it looks like to give everything we are as an offering to you. Help us to know what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis as we follow the leading of your spirit and as we uh, empty ourselves and uh, put on Christ fully day after day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading will be Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's all stand as we sing this song before Matt brings us the message this morning. The song is a good reminder about how we're not supposed to keep our light hidden under a basket. Uh, we're supposed to let that shine no matter where we're at. Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the heathen are at home, beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Receive thee freely, freely give, from every land they call. Unless they hear they cannot live, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. We're going to take a moment to uh, pray for Matt, and uh, we just want to say thank you to Matt for all the, the uh, hard work and the the hours spent in getting prepared for today. Uh, I just uh, pray that you, I want you to pray with me now. Lord God, I just thank you for uh, Matt and the message that he brings to us, that uh, this comes from you, that your words will speak clearly through him, and that we'll glean out the things that need to be gleaned, and that we'll, our hearts will be changed because of it. And I uh, just thank you for him today, and thank you for uh, the blessed message that will come in Jesus' name. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am very thankful to get to speak to you this morning. And Steve, I especially appreciate your prayer. Wade, thanks for the song you led just before uh, I came up to preach. And Steve prayed for us. I don't know if you noticed on that song, uh, the name at the bottom of the first slide was a guy named J.M. McCaleb. J.M. McCaleb was a missionary to Japan at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s. And it's funny that you should lead that song because he's the one that helped awaken some of the mission-mindedness that we'll talk about in just a minute in our fellowship. Speaking of mission, I really appreciate the prayer guide that was in the bulletin last week, these little pink inserts. And I hope that uh, you kept that. I don't know about you, but I keep mine in my Bible so that I can remember to pray for these different people every day. And today we're praying specifically for our mission in Great Falls. Praying that God would stir every heart here, that God would open doors of opportunity, prayers that God would, would work through us to increase the harvest here in Great Falls. And so I encourage you to be prayerful about these missions and these works every day. Because it's hard to get concerned about missions anywhere and not get mis concerned about missions right at your own doorstep. So pray that you, I pray that you will pray with us on that so that we can all become more and more aware of how we can participate God's mission in this world. As we get started, I want to just remind you that what we're doing today is part of our year of honor. 
And this year of honor is not merely honoring God, although that's the cornerstone and the capstone of it, but it's also about helping us honor each other. And because this is our 75th anniversary as a church, helping us honor the contributions of saints to the ages that helped, that helped get us here. And so I want to just remind you as we get started where we left off last time, that Scripture demonstrates the value of telling and retelling our story, our history. More than half of the entire Bible, significantly more than half of the entire Bible, is simply story. God's people telling the story of what God did in the midst of them. That's in the Old Testament, Genesis through Esther. Israel retold its story over and over to maintain identity from generation to generation and from nation to nation. They retold their story to ask questions like, how did we get here, wherever they were at the time? And, and where can we go from here? Christians in the New Testament did the very same thing. In the Gospels and Acts, they were asking questions about who they were, so they retold their story to maintain their identity as the Gospel moved from generation to generation and from nation to nation. They retold their story as a way of forming themselves into the likeness of the living Lord. They retold their story to rekindle the flames of hope and keep them burning bright in the hearts of the people of God. I share all of this simply to remind you that I think a biblical perspective is that our past is always present in our present. The things that have come before this present moment, the influences that have come before are always present and always at work. And so from time to time, like this year, for example, we need to spend some time walking through our story together because I believe it's one of the surest ways to glean wisdom for the next 75 years of our history together. So this morning, I want to pick up where we left off last time. And I want to continue the story of God's work here in Great Falls. And my encouragement to you is this. As we go through two things. Number one, listen for the way that I've woven Scripture through this. This isn't your typical sermon where I'm expounding on a biblical text. This is us listening to the text that is this church. Paul told the Corinthians that they themselves were a letter sent by him, written with the, the Spirit of God on tablets of human hearts. And I believe the same thing's true of us. So this morning we're expounding not on a written text, but on a living text. The way that God has been at work in shaping this people for mission for 75 years. Pay attention to what he's doing. Because the same principles that allow you to recognize what God's doing in this living text will allow you to recognize what He's doing in your own life. Listen for what God is doing as we go through. As we get started, I remind you that our church began right as the United States was just coming through World War II. Early on in our history, our movement had been very pacifist. There was a strong segment of anti-war, anti-government sentiment in our people, but World War II and Foy E. Wallace on the bottom of the screen there effectively decimated that last holdout. Around the time of World War II, you may remember from last time that there was this idea that was recently developed in our movement that we were the only ones going to heaven. That was not who we were from the very beginning, but that idea developed in the 1920s and the 1930s that we were the only ones. Another idea that was not present from the beginning but developed much later was the idea that God really isn't all that involved in this world. That it's really up to us if anybody is going to get saved or if anything godly is going to get done in this world, it's really up to us. As world War II began, most of our people in our fellowship were pretty rural people. They came from small town America and most of them knew that most people around them had already heard the gospel at least to some degree. But with World War II, as our people moved beyond pacifism, they joined the war effort with vigor. And the war took them all over the world. And all across the world, they encountered lost people. And they had the experience that Jesus, I believe, had with his apostles when he looked out in Samaria and he said, don't say there are so many months until the harvest. Just look around. Open your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest. All around them. The only need was for workers. 
people to go out, people to share the gospel with the world. And in this moment, what happened is our people heard the call for workers and they became unprecedentedly mission minded at this time. At a time, by the way, when all the wealth of the nations was streaming in the United States, it seemed, our economy flourished, and the churches of Christ directed most of that wealth that came into their churches toward getting the gospel into all the world. One interesting little case study is this guy right here. His name is Dr. John Paul Gibson. He was a physician, a pediatrician from Abilene, Texas. If you're about to be a deacon next week, Potentially, I don't know the ones that will for certain be deacons, but, but if you are going to be a deacon next week, I want you to especially listen about this guy. This guy was appointed a deacon by the Highland Church in Abilene, Texas in the very early 1940s. And God put a passion in John Paul Gibson's heart in the early 40s. He wanted to see churches of Christ in all of the cities in the United States that did not have a church of Christ. And so when he was appointed a deacon, he was blessed with that mission uh, by the elders of the Highland Church. And so he contacted a man named James Lovell. James Lovell was not a preacher, but he was an editor in our movement. And he had the same passion in his heart. So Gibson calls Lovell and says, Lovell, I am interested in putting a church in the cities in the United States where there isn't one. And he says, can you give me any suggestions? And the guy said off the top of his head... He said, I can think of three right away. Missoula, Montana, Helena, Montana, and Great Falls, Montana. Gibson in Abilene, Texas, a deacon in the 1940s. This was October and November of 1942. Wrote to the papers in Missoula and Helena and Great Falls and published this ad, which is a little bit hard to read unless you, you zoom in and blow it up. But he was looking for members of Churches of Christ. Well, it turns out that he got almost no response from Missoula. Almost no response from Great Falls. But the one place he did get response was from Helena, Montana. And this little bitty article that you see there right in the middle is the reason there's a Helena Church of Christ today. One simple little article in a newspaper in October of 1942 that leads to the establishing of the Helena Church. The reason that's important is because the Helena Church soon grows so significantly that they're able to bring in a guy named Charles Baker Middleton in 1943. He is a church planting evangelist whose fiery passion was seeing the Church of Christ established in places where it wasn't. They brought him in in 1943 and he helped them through the mid-40s. And eventually, because he fanned the flame of the fires of mission... They freed him to do what Scott Laird does, which is basically go across the state supporting churches and, and helping build the church. One of the first places he got to do that was, ironically, in Missoula. He went and preached a gospel meeting in September of 1946 in which there were so many responses and he was so effective, they tried to hire Middleton to come down and be their preacher. And he said, okay, I'll do it, but it'll be next year before I can get there, 1947. Well, in the meantime, John Paul Gibson sends him a letter and calls him back to Texas to do some fundraising for the Missoula Church. And while he is away back in Abilene answering Gibson's letter, the church in Missoula gets a letter from Wes Haven, who was in Pocatello, Idaho at the time. And Wes Haven wants to come and be their preacher. So they hire him instead. And Middleton ends up going back to Missoula, Montana in 1947, and I'm so, so thankful that he did. If I had been this preacher, and I had accepted your call to a church, and you hired a preacher out from under me, how do you think I'd feel? This little firecracker would be ticked. But God was at work. God was at work. You see, at just this particular moment in time, in January of 1947, an assistant district manager for International Harvester from Denver, Montana, Den Denver, Montana, Denver, Colorado, received a promotion. He was promoted to district manager and immediately sent to Great Falls, Montana. He comes in and immediately gets involved in the town. He jumped right in in the Civil Air Patrol, and this is 1947. He jumped right in in late 1947. He was one of 15 people in a city of about 44,000 people that was appointed 
to the city of commerce, the chamber of commerce. But there was one organization that he couldn't join because in 1947 it wasn't here. If he wanted to join the church, he would have to drive all the way to the Wolf Creek Canyon to worship at Helena, which it seems is what he did. And in early 1947, because Missoula had hired another preacher instead of him, guess who they got to meet in Missoula? They got to meet Charles Baker Middleton, who was the one who had that fiery passion for seeing the churches of Christ established in cities where there weren't any. Joe and Vera Chitwood knew that this was the time for Great Falls. The city had grown by nearly 13,000 in the last decade. The Air Force Base, East Base, was up and running. Coming through the war, it was very clear it was going to be repurposed and some other things were going to happen. And so the city was continuing to grow with a housing boom. And they knew, like the sons of Issachar, they knew the times. And they knew the fullness of time for Great Falls had come. So, driving to Helena in early 1947, they meet Middleton, and it seems that with his blessing and the blessing of Helena, they agree to start the church. And so, on May the 9th of 1948, they run this ad in the Great Falls Tribune. And in the old YMCA building, which was downtown where the old Hardee's is now, they met, and there were five, of, five members that were present. There was Middleton, the preacher, there was Ron and Vera Chitwood, their son, Ronald, or Joseph and Vera Chitwood, their son, Ronald, Jesse and Dacia Irby, and then there was a sister from Arkansas who had moved here named, uh, well, Miss Holland is what she was called. They met there, and it's interesting when you look at the early days of a church, because some things will change, but some things never change. The very next Sunday, this is May 16th, 1948, I'll just notice what Middleton preaches. A theme that I think you'll still hear in this church today. He preaches that we are to be a back to the Bible church. Does that sound familiar to you? We are to be a back to the Bible church. May 16th of 1948. And I find in that, Paul's words to Timothy really resonating. Paul told Timothy, he said, follow the pattern of sound words or healthy words which you heard from me and the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And that becomes the founding cry of our church. A back to the Bible church that's guarding the good deposits, the pattern of sound words that was given to us. It seems in that early meeting that the Chitwoods were recognized as leaders, and it's a very good thing they were, because within two months, every single member but them would be gone. On July the 11th, Holt, Sister Holland and then the Irbys announced that they were leaving and moving elsewhere. On July the 25th, C.B. Middleton stood up and told them that he was going back to Texas for more training, and only the Chitwoods were left. Did any of you know John Haywood, or did you know John Haywood from Helena? Helena then sent down John's father. John's family came to build the church in Montana in 1945. And Ollie Haywood was the one that Helena sent down to preach for us the last two weeks we were open in 1948. But because he was coming to Great Falls, the Chitwoods said it'd be just as easy for them to go to Helena. And so they officially closed the doors of the Church of Christ on August the 8th, 1948. But it seems that they did that with faith. And I say that because I don't know if you, how well you can read this, but this is the ledger from this period in our church history. And I didn't tear that out. It was already, I think Scott did it. But um, <laughs> it was already torn out. But you can see August 1 collections, and then you can see August 8 collections. And on August the 8th, the last Sunday that we met, there were $5 offered in the collection. Well, if this was your last Sunday, what would you do with those $5? Notice what they did. They spent $4 in stamps, envelopes, and paper. And they wrote immediately to more than 100 churches across the country asking for help. This is not a people that is quitting. They closed the doors, but they did not close the doors. So in the meantime, they drive back to Helena. Now, I don't know if this is the case or not, but I know that it would be just like God. The one who sustains all things 
and even works new things is the one that founded things and created things in the beginning. And I don't know, but I just sometimes wonder driving through the Wolf Creek Canyon if it was driving through that canyon that ignited their faith. As they saw what God had done, I wonder if stirrings of what God could do yet in Great Falls began to awaken in them. And I wonder that because they really didn't drive to Helena for very long. In fact, they did it for less than a month when they ran this tiny, it's small if you've seen it in the original print. They ran this tiny little ad in the Great Falls Tribune from September 15th to 19th, 1948. And that's when an Air Force family, you listening? That's when an Air Force family named Bud and Signe Ives and their young family, they answered the call and said, well, you can come and meet in our home if you would like, and we'll get the church going again. That ad also reached a guy named James Marion Toll, who was a 32-year-old preacher, uh, a 32-year-old preacher who had accepted a teaching job, of all things, in Geyser, Montana. That makes absolutely no sense. This guy was one of the best trained preachers in our movement in this day and time. He had preached from one side of the country, Florida, Tampa, all the way to California, and many places in between. The only reason in the world that I can think of that he would be in Geyser, Montana in 1948 for one year is that he was burned out. He was burned out and needed a break. And so he goes to Geyser, Montana to teach English, coach PE, and coach basketball for a year to get away from ministry. But he gets there and he realizes there's not a church there. And that's when he sees this little note. And he writes the Chitwood, and uh, Chitwoods, and I imagine says something like this. He says, you know, I'm a preacher without a church. And you're a church without a preacher. You think maybe we could, you know. Seriously, that's how I imagine it going. And what ends up happening is he agrees to drive the 45 miles into Great Falls from Geyser. Each week at his own expense, and he agrees to preach for them. He becomes, by the way, he gets 21st century Christian, the, the publisher in Nashville. He becomes one of the founders of 21st century Christian. He is the most prolific writing evangelist in the 20th century in Churches of Christ. And God had this burned out 32-year-old in Geyser, Montana in 1948 at just the right time. Tell me you don't see God's hand in that. Wow. So on October the 3rd, 1948, the church begins again in the Ives home. They immediately begin drawing other members. They run this ad from December 12, 1907 through 12, 1948. And this is when they make uh, contact with John and Francis Prater. The Praters come in uh, in response to this ad. And by the way, Frances Prater was the very first baptism that this church ever had. She was not a Christian, but her husband was. She was baptized. And, and when the Praters come in, it seems to have ignited the church, especially have ignited its evangelistic fervor. Because the church realized that if they did just a few things differently, they could reach a whole lot more John and Frances Praters. So immediately they did three things. The first thing is they took almost all the money in the bank and they invested it in three lots on the corner of 3400 and Central. Three lots. The fourth was bought by Toll, this single preacher from Geyser, Montana. They put all their money into a place that was still developing in Great Falls. Another thing they did is they immediately moved the location. They thought, you know, if we have a more public location, we'll catch more people. So they moved to the Bungalow Bakery, which was downtown, and they moved there in December of 1948. And then the next thing that they did is they began publishing their message so that the community had an idea of what this group was all about. And I want you to just notice the title of Toll's article from February 21st, 1949. He writes this article arguing, in effect, that American democracy is very consistent with the basic principles of the gospel. And that is so significant because 30 years ago, you never would have heard that message preached in Churches of Christ. We had changed. We had changed so that we could culturally engage the world. Democracy and moral movement, he preaches this at the time when patriotism had swelled following World War II, when people were suspicious of communism and for democracy. 
In other words, he preaches a message that shows that the church can be an ally of culture. That the church can, in fact, seek the good of the city wherever it is. I think it's interesting that this is kind of a watershed when people start coming into our church. You look at the records, it's when he preaches this sermon that the baptisms really start happening. I think that's interesting. Another thing that happened with Toll, though, and probably the most significant thing, was not so much his preaching, it wasn't so much his leadership, it was that he left at the end of the school year and he went on a preaching tour of the South. And while he was there, he just happened to come to Baytown, Texas, which is really close to Houston, if you know your Texas geography, which I didn't. But he comes to the Baytown Church of Christ, and he meets with them, and I'm assuming he preaches for them. And I can almost imagine the conversation going something like this. What in the world were you doing in Great Falls, Montana for the last year? And he starts telling them about what God had been doing in the Church of Christ in Great Falls, Montana. And you get this enthusiastic elder group that is just fired up about what God had been doing here. This church, the Virginia Street Church of Christ, was a church that had already started two churches at this point. They would grow to a certain point, and then they'd start a new church. And so when he met them, this resonated with them. They were replication, multiplication-minded. They're so enthusiastic that they send two elders almost immediately to Great Falls. Luther Stainer and Sam Herring fly up and they meet with the Chitwoods and the young church and they must have been so impressed because over the next four years they'll send $45,000 into Great Falls. At least that's from a personal letter that's written by one of the ministers of the church in that time period. Nearly $45,000 over the next four years. It's a significant investment. A lot of that, not all of it, would have gone towards supporting the L.Q. Robinson family. And I want you to notice the dates from when he arrives. Toll meets with them in August of 1949. Herring and Stainer fly up immediately. And then within the month, they've got a preacher on the ground here in Great Falls. A preacher who, by the way, had just spent about five years with a church helping them build a building. Which if you'd asked our people what our biggest need was in this time, they would have told you, we need a building. Do you not see God's hand in that? Amen. It's amazing. So Toll comes up here. And I want you to notice the article in the Times, uh, the, the Tribune from his first Sunday here. You can zoom in and read the rest of it if you want, but I've highlighted what I think is the most interesting portion of it. The day that he, the week after he gets here, it says work so, begins soon on a building on Central Avenue auditorium and educational facilities to accommodate a congregation of... Y'all thought I was crazy when we did the grand opening and I told you to prepare for 700 people? In 1949, our people had the vision for a 700-member church in Great Falls, Montana. Now, it could be that that's a typo and it's supposed to be 70. But I tend to think what I've seen, what I've read, this is the vision. This is the evangelistic fervor of that 40-member group that we've been talking about for the last little bit. They wanted to see a 700-member congregation here in Great Falls. I think that's incredible. Probably the biggest thing Robinson did for them, though, not just helping them with the building, Robinson helped the church develop a cohesive identity. And I hope that you'll hear the familiarity in what I'm about to share with you. To, plant, uh, to establish a building... We had to appoint a board of trustees. And so the church appointed a three-person trustee team. And in that trust document from July of 1950, the church spells out who it is trying to be and who it will be. And in that document, they spell out that we are a back-to-the-Bible people. We are a people that believe the Bible and the Bible only is God's inspired word. It's the revelation of how we live lives of godliness. We're a back to the Bible people. That back to the Bible includes the plan of salvation. We believe in the Lord Jesus. We repent of our sins. We confess that Jesus is Lord, the Son of God. And we're baptized in water where by faith in Him we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Spirit. We followed the biblical plan of salvation and they spelled it out in great detail. 
We were a people that wanted to follow the Bible when it came to worship. Praying, yes. Communing weekly, yes. Singing without instruments, yes. Giving, yes. Preaching the Bible, yes. New Testament worship. And one of the things they say is that we want to follow the exact pattern of New Testament teaching as our only rule of faith and practice. I don't know that I'd use the word pattern today, but when you ask what our stance is regarding Scripture, I hope it's not very much different from that. Of following as close as we can the New Testament as our only guide of faith and practice. That was 1950. Another thing, he stressed that we should be a people. He calls it, uh, he speaks about uh, speaking as the oracles of God, quoting 1 Peter 4.11. Robinson does. But Robinson also encouraged us to be a narrow-minded people. And I, I first read that and I thought, I don't want to be narrow-minded. Who wants to be narrow-minded? But the more I read, the more I'm realizing he was talking the same way that Jesus was talking in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, when Jesus said, enter by, the, enter by the narrow gate. Don't just assume that things are okay. Go back to the Bible and check. Be very careful to read Scripture and read Scripture carefully. So he called us to biblical narrow-mindedness. He asked in 1952, do we really want to go back to the Bible? Because apparently that had become a saying, a slogan in our congregation. And he said, do we really mean that? And then sharing with the community, do you all really believe that? He called us back to the Bible. He emphasized the value of the Lord's Supper. He emphasized the authority of, of baptism as it appears in the New Testament. And I find it interesting that one prominent theme early on was unity. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> was unity. If you look at this article and you zoom in on it, he writes this, unanimous conformation to the divine pattern, there's that word again, would result in the oneness of believers for which Christ prayed. He had a different idea about unity than I do. Maybe even than some of you do. But this church was founded to help promote the unity for which our Lord had prayed. Unity that is spelled out very clearly in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 through 6. Another piece of our identity that comes in this very early period, on April the 8th of 1951, the church moves into this building. That's hard to see, so I gave you a more modern picture from 1973. And this was the old building that was underneath the parking lot right beside the, the old green building at 3400 Central. Our identity became tied to that location at 3400 Central Avenue. And we were there for 68 years, and it shaped a lot about who we were, and it shaped a lot about how we thought about mission. Another piece of our identity that came from this time is it was during these very early days that we became an Air Force congregation. That wasn't something that came years later. It was there from the very beginning. A guy named Don Hockaday had written trying to start the church here in 1931. Gibson had written in 1942 trying to start the church. But it wasn't until East Base was up and running that there were enough members here to start a church. And Vera Chitwood wrote in April of 1951, because a large percentage of our members are in the Air Force, we have an unusually large shifting of membership. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds very familiar to me. So what I hope you see in this I've taken you up to 1952 this morning. We've slowed down to focus on these early years. And the reason I wanted to do that is what I want you to see is that the very earliest days of our church, our values as a church were set. Things that we still value today, mission. This is a great commission church. A restoration church, a back to the Bible church, a let's do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible things by Bible names church. We're a unity church. For 68 years, we were a 3400 Central Avenue church. And for much of our existence, we were an Air Force church. Now, as we wrap up, I want to briefly give you four reflections, four quick reflections on all of this. And the first has to do with providence. The very first reflection has to do with providence. And I, I don't know about you, but I can't look at our story and not see the hand of God 
all the way through these early days in our movement. I could give you example after example, but I've just told you the story, and I'd encourage you to reflect on that yourself. Even when our people didn't believe God was present and active in the world, God was present and active in the world. And they may not have seen it or heard it or felt it in the goings on at that time, but looking back, it is undeniable. And what I would tell you this morning is that God is no less active today. God is no less active or no less present today. He's still just as involved in your life and in my life and in the life of this church, just as he was then. Another thing I hope you see in this story is the way that God equips his people for mission. As you look through this story, it's amazing to me that God used Jim Lovell, a traveling salesman. He used that knowledge Lovell gleaned from, from traveling in order to put Great Falls and Montana on Gibson's map. He used the passions of a lot of different people to do great things in his kingdom. He used the jobs of a lot of people. International Harvester, the Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Paul Railway, the Great Northern Railway, the Air Force. He used the jobs of so many people as a platform from which to expand his kingdom mission. Whatever God has given you, he has given you so that you can build his kingdom. And I don't know what ability, I don't know what interest, I don't know what passion, uh, what gift, what talent that is, but whatever it is, I encourage you to make it available to the Lord. Use it for his mission. The third thing I want to point out is we look at this story and I think it helps us better understand who we are. It helps us understand who we are as we reflect on some things that have changed and some things that have not changed. When I think about some things that have changed, we're no longer strict patternists because I think we recognize that Scripture is more than a pattern. It's more than a rule book. We still order our lives by it, but we don't read it legalistically like this generation did. We no longer see perfect conformity as the path to unity. If you ask us to perfectly agree on literally everything, let me remind you of two words. 2020. It just doesn't work. Unity does not come through conformity or uniformity. We're no longer at Central Avenue or on the east side. After 71 years, God brought us to a completely different part of town. And another thing that I think is changing is that we don't have as many active duty Air Force airmen and airwomen as we once did. We're still an Air Force car. I have no doubt about that. But increasingly, our membership is made up of people who have less and less ties to the United States Air Force. Just look around. I think you can see that. What has not changed? I think it's interesting that some things have changed, but there's so much that hasn't. We are still very much a back to the Bible church, a restoration church. We are still very much a unity church that wants to see the unity accomplished for which Jesus prayed. And we are still very, very much a mission-minded church. That has not changed. And I pray to God that it will not change. And the fourth thing, I believe there's reason for great hope. God has done great things in this church. God's the real hero of the story. He was faithful in the work of His people. He's been faithful even beyond the work of his people. And so I want to encourage us to remember God doesn't change. He's the same God today that he was then. And so let's continue to be the kind of people who would go for broke, betting on the goodness and the providence of God as we go forward, building on these providential foundations. Well, I'm finished, and I appreciate your patience as this went just a little bit long. As we close, I want to offer the Lord's invitation to you. You've heard me talk about the plan of salvation this morning. And so if you're ready to become a Christian this morning, if you have more questions about becoming a Christian, please come forward and let us know that and we'll help you take your next steps. If you are a Christian and you would like to ask for prayer, we have an amazing God who would love to hear from you. Let's stand, let's sing, and if you need to respond, do so. Have you a heart? 
sitting in an attic or a basement somewhere just flipping through pages and finding all this information. It's pretty amazing and uh, it's nice to know that we, we have a foundation and uh, our foundation goes far beyond Great Falls, Montana. It goes, you know, as you think back in the Old Testament and such, uh, my goodness, our God has watched over us. And uh, the exciting thing is that he is preparing each one of us. Each one of us are part of this journey. And uh, he's planning on using us in some fashion. But we have to have our hearts in the right place. Uh, we have a few uh, uh, prayer requests today. Uh, continued pray, uh, prayer for Howard Jess Jessen. Um, I don't know if he's still in the hospital, is he? He's still in the hospital, so if there's a chance to get up and see him, that's probably a good idea. Um, but uh, be in prayer for him that he, his body will heal. Uh, Betty LaBelle is fighting both pneumonia and bronchitis and would like prayers and healing uh, and better health than she has <coughs> presently. Uh, continued prayers for the deacon selection process. Names submitted for consideration are Trevor Buffington, Rudy uh, Kegel, uh, Sam Kolb, Ross Lucasen, and Skip Sterner. Uh, so be in, in prayer for each of them. And your feedback is due today. Uh, if you have any thoughts uh, regarding them, please bring, bring those to uh, the shepherds and uh, uh, we'll make sure that they get consideration. Um, the, uh, the selection process will be on June 18th, which is next uh, Sunday, and I think there's a lot of things happening next Sunday. So be prepared for next Sunday. Um, announcements today, we have Doug Clannon uh, died this last Thursday. His funeral service will be Tuesday, June 20th at Croxford Funeral Home at 11 a.m., followed by the cremation. Uh, viewing at the funeral home will be from 5 to 7 p.m. on Monday the 19th. The, fun uh, the funeral lunch will be uh, catered through the funeral home and will be served after the funeral service at Croxford's. 
and we want to be in, in prayer for Rachel and for her family as well. Um, I also ask that you be in prayer for, for Remco and his father's passing uh, this past week. Uh, just uh, you know, let, let Remco and the family know that you care about them and that you're, you're with them at this time. Uh, the, uh, now, please excuse me if uh, the, 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 no, the, I always do this. The Mel, Mel, where are you? James are you in here? Huh? James and Berna. Thank you. James and Berna will be moving to Oregon. Please uh, join us after the second service on Sunday, June 25th for the sending. Remember to sign the sending book on the back counter. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, I, I just ask that you be with us now as we, uh, as we consider these requests. Uh, Lord God, you are a God that, that uh, is eternal, that uh, you've, been, you've had your hand in everything that's gone on throughout uh, all time. And Father, that you brought us to this point. Uh, you're trying to teach us to be the people that love Jesus and, and love your word. And Father, that are filled with the Holy Spirit. And, Father, I pray that you'll just be in us, Lord God. Guide us to be uh, strong in our, in our convictions and, and to be uh, Bible-centered. Uh, I just thank you for that. Father, I pray that you uh, will uh, watch over those that we've talked about, Howard Jensen and his health, um, with uh, Betty LaBelle and her desires to have better health. She has been suffering and she just needs some relief. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll uh, watch over the deacons and the process that we're going through and the selection that will take place next week. I just pray that you bless the lives of each of those that have been, uh, that are on the list. And Lord God, that they are seriously considering uh, the work ahead of them and are, are getting excited for what they will be able to do within this body. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll uh, uh, yeah, just be with uh, uh, Doug Clannon's family and uh, their their time of grief and with uh, rum going about us and as they're uh, dealing with loss as well. And Father, pray that you be with uh, um, uh, just, Lord God, with the families that, that have come and have gone and, and wherever they go, Lord God, that you'll help us uh, to be not only supportive of them, but they'll take the, the gospel with them wherever they go. I just thank you for this day, for your love for us. Father, as we uh, set out into the mission field here soon, that you will uh, put us to work. Help us to, to, uh, to use what you've taught us to be strong in our faith and to know that, uh, that you love us and uh, care about us. Father, please be with those that are searching for you right now. If there's any in this room, that they'll, uh, they'll uh, seek out someone to uh, let that be known and that we might be able to rally up and support them. I just thank you for your care today. We love you. We love Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be excused. <laughs>